All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So my name is Lee Reiners. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of the Global Financial Market Center uh, here at Duke Law. And before I introduce today's guest, I want to briefly uh, preview a conference that we'll be co-sponsoring next month on March 20th uh, at the Fuqua School of Business. It'll be a day-long reflection on the lasting impact of uh, the financial crisis. So we have a tremendous group of speakers lined up. We have the former CEOs of Bear Stearns, Bank of New York Mellon, uh, Morgan Stanley, as well as the former Deputy Treasury Secretary, Sarah Bloom Raskin. Uh, we have um, David Rubenstein will be there, as well as some of our uh, more prominent faculty members, including Professor Cox and uh, Professor Baxter. So go to our website uh, to find out more information about that and to RSVP. It's free to attend, so definitely encourage you to, um, to check that out. So with that, uh, it's my privilege to introduce today's guest, Aaron Klein. Uh, Aaron is a Fellow in Economic Studies and Policy Director of the Center on Regulation and Markets at the Brookings Institution. He focuses on financial regulation and technology, macroeconomics, and infrastructure finance and policy. Previously, Aaron directed the Bipartisan Policy Center's Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative, where he launched the first bipartisan comprehensive review of Dodd-Frank, as well as a CEO Council on Infrastructure. Aaron served at the Treasury Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy during the first term of the Obama presidency. While at Treasury, Aaron worked on financial regulatory reform issues, including crafting and helping secure passage of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And he also played leading roles in housing finance reform, transportation, and infrastructure policy, as well as Native American policy. Prior to his appointment at Treasury, Aaron served as Chief Economist of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee for Chairman Chris Dodd, and Paul Sarbanes. While working in the Senate, Aaron played a key role in a series of major legislation, including the Economic Emergency Stabilization Act of 2008, better known as TARP, the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, the Safety Act of 2005 that rewrote America's surface transportation policy, the Check Truncation Act of 2003, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002, and the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Klein is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Aaron to Duke. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to see my good friend and former colleague, one of the commissioners of the task force I ran at the Bipartisan Policy Center, Jim Cox, uh, who was just uh, incredibly helpful in crafting and helping to author uh, a report on implementation of Dodd-Frank, particularly something known as the Volcker Rule. Uh, we had a joke when we were doing Dodd-Frank that uh, everything within Dodd-Frank kind of made sense. And any part of Dodd-Frank that you come across that has a different name attached to it kind of didn't make sense with the core of the rest of it, whether it was um, Volcker or Wicker or Durbin or whatever else you want to say, all these named amendments. Uh, for those of you that study banking law, and I'm presuming many of you here are, uh, that's why you're here, uh, it's a really weird thing that banking laws tend to be named after members of Congress. I'm not aware of any other part of law that have so many bills named after members. It was kind of a pleasure to work for two, uh, Senators Sarbanes and Dodd, who both got bills. Uh, someday I've thought about doing a research project of which senators get bills and which, which don't. Uh, that's not whether your bill's good or bad, uh, it's just if you have a name on it. Uh, that being said, it's a real pleasure to be here at, at Duke. Uh, you guys have an amazing group of people. Lee's put it up forward. The list you have coming for this next thing in, in 10 years with my former colleague and friend Sarah Bloom Raskin and David Rubenstein um, uh, and, and many others. You guys are really fortunate and I'm privileged to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about something that I think people experience every day but don't appreciate how its existence and how it works contributes to what I think is the greatest problem facing American society today, which is the giant inequality in income. We've reached as a society levels of income inequality that really haven't been reached since the 1920s, which after their Great Depression had a huge resorting of income. Uh, people talk today about this crazy idea of a marginal tax rate of 70%. Back then, after the Great Depression, after World War II, the marginal ta tax rate was 90%. That was law. That wasn't an idea. That was actually the world in America. 
Uh, I was reading a piece today about how in Rome, a lot of people think the decline of Rome started with a huge growth in income inequality that then threatened the core democracy around the second century BC. And if you think our, our democracy is in a little more trouble now than it has been historically, which I think is fair to say, I don't think that's, I think that's highly correlated with our, our growing income inequality. And you know, America is a great country in the sense I don't think anybody begrudges a, you know, Jeff Bezos for having made a bunch of money in making Amazon in the world a better place, and Bill Gates the same. Uh, that being said, dynastic growth of wealth at concentration levels we've seen, I think is more deeply problematic. I'll give you a, a fact. The three richest people in America own more than the poorest half of America. So 160 million Americans, from the, the poorest homeless person to the definition of middle class, the median American, all the way down, if you add up their entire net worth, it's less than the three richest people. Uh, and that's kind of the Bernie Sanders argument, right? That 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. I'm not here to talk about that in the payment system. What I'm here to talk about is how the payment system deeply penalizes the bottom half and greatly rewards the top 10%. And let me be very specific. According to the Federal Reserve, to be in the top 10% of Americans, you have to have a million dollars of total net worth. That's the equity in your home, plus your retirement account, plus the evaluation of your defined benefit contribution plan, everything you want to say. And for any of you who've taken a basic finance course, based on the income I'm going to expect that you were hoping to make as Duke Law graduates, uh, I would guess that your goal is to save over a million dollars. Uh, it would be my guess that many of your parents have achieved that goal. Uh, and that makes you in the top 10%. To give you an idea of the distribution, the middle point, that median person I told you, they have a net worth today of $100,000, mostly in their home. Uh, the bottom 25%, one out of four Americans, has 25,000 or less, and 10% of Americans are negative. I'm gonna guess on the basis of your college and law school loans that the group that are negative net worth here today may be a little bit higher. Uh, but you've all made smart investments in your future, and I'm going to guess that, that the vast majority of Duke Law graduates end up in the top 10%, and those that don't are probably not by choice, having pursued different types of careers. But even a good public interest career should, should end you with a million dollars of, of savings. And I want to talk to you about this payment system, and I'm going to do it in two different parts. And so part one, I want to ask you what Capital One asks you. What's in your wallet? So Take out your wallet, Does, or your phone, if some people only use your phone. And I'm going to start guessing what's in your wallet, and let me see a show of hands. I worked at the Treasury Department, so my favorite bill is the 10. How many people out here have money in their wallet? OK. That's a much higher showing of people than is often told the case. There's this great story that nobody's using cash. Cash is dying. Two-thirds of all transactions at $10 or less are made in cash. But it's not to spend money on it. It's just in case we get mugged. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to pay the mugger? Well, I'll tell you. Um, it's interesting. We don't have good numbers as to what percent of transactions are made in cash. Uh, when I pay my niece to babysit for my small kids, uh, and she asks me to Venmo, and I look at her blankly and hand her money. Um, uh, uh, we don't have good data on that, uh, but we do have good data on non-cash payments. So let me start with the next. How many, pe how, how many people here have a prepaid card? One. If you're getting mugged, your muggers probably uses prepaid. 10% uh, of all transactions in America are done on prepaid cards. I'm going to repeat that stat, and I'll give it to you in a ratio. Uh, one out of every 10 transactions is done in a prepaid card. Now, there's only one person in the room here who raised their hand. I'm going to guess that the rest of you don't have prepaid cards. So think about the fact that you're doing 0 out of 10 means somebody else is doing a lot more than 1 out of 10. These are radically common among people who are not just the 7% of Americans who lack bank accounts. They're here. But they're 20% of Americans who are what the FDIC categorizes as underbanked. That is, they pay money for services that the wealthy get for free in banking. 
average minimum balance, overdraft, payday loan, short-term loan. And for these people, they've realized that these types of cards, even though they have little $2 to buy, a dollar activation, are safer and more secure assets for them, easier to transact with than uh, uh, cash, because they have all the advantages of being a card, and are cheaper for them for the next common thing, moving up the income distribution. The poorest people and others. Next. How many of you have a debit card? Okay, right, I was assuming this would be near universal, right? The debit card is the next situation up here. This is the standard banked person. You don't, this is what I would call the neutral in this situation. I'll explain later why these people are losing money and who's gaining it. You don't get really any rewards or anything back from this, but it doesn't really cost you unless you have an overdraft. That's 35 bucks, that's very expensive. It's universally accepted. I'll get into how it works. This has exploded in growth. This was the giant explosion of growth until the prepaid came along and started eating at debit, in part because debit is expensive to those who may touch the zero lower bound of their bank account. But for those who don't, it's fine. It offers no pluses, no minuses. The next part I'm going to say is the credit card. Who here has a credit card? Okay, again, near universal acceptance. <laughs> But the credit cards that we have are universally accepted on the higher end, but are, are not really available to the people who have debit cards or, or who have prepaid cards, and may be available, but if you have a debit card, you probably aren't paying this off. The average American family has $7,000 balance on their credit card. For those of you who realize, if you have a balance, you're paying interest between 15 and 39% on every transaction you make until you pay it off. If you pay your credit card off every month, like I do, because I'm in the top 10%, if you pay your credit card off every month, you get 30 days of grace. That's a nice little advantage, right? That's an advantage that I have of the debit, where I have to, it has to get settled um, in the next day or two. We'll talk about the speed of it later. But let me ask you guys, what, what is this? What would you call this? Can, is this a law school? Can I just call on people? Because you can't do that in policy school or in economics programs. What is this? Who, who, who is giving me money on this? Correct. This is not a Southwest card. This is not a visa. This is prime advertising space that Visa and Southwest have taken up. It's actually a direct line of credit with J.P. Morgan Chase. And this is a revolving loan that J.P. Morgan Chase has made to me and is made on the basis that they've seen that I'm rich and I'm a good bet. And what is the terms of this? Why is J.P. Morgan Chase giving me access to a lot of spending? What does J.P. Morgan Chase get out of this card and what do I get out of it? So here's what J.P. right? I, I, I was in a room where we were having this conversation with one of your, your, your um, uh, another great Duke professor, uh, Puri, in the business school, and she was talking about credit cards and this or that. And one of my very distinguished colleagues said, well, J.P. Morgan Chase gets nothing from me. I pay my card every month in full. That they thought that the credit card was after your interest fees or your late fees. That's not the case with this card. With a subprime credit card where there's a high default risk, that is. What J.P. Morgan Chase is getting is 2 to 3% of everything I buy on this. And that's a swipe fee. And who's paying that is the merchant who's chosen to accept it. And the merchant's actually going to pay closer to 3 to 4%, depending on uh, there are a couple other transactions, you know, the little square cash they may have or the little Verifone machine. That person's going to take a little bit of a slip. And if I choose to use this in an Apple Pay format, how many of you, you guys use Apple Pay? A couple hands. Apple's going to get 50 basis points half of 1%, they're going to tack it on to this for using the digital representation of this. But J.P. Morgan Chase is going to get 2 to 3% of that transaction. Now I'm an economist, right? The first thing is say, well, the merchant's paying that 2 to 3%. But the merchant is required to offer the same cash, the same price to me, regardless of whether or not I go to them with $10 
or I go to them with this or an Amex or the Sapphire. I forgot my, I, I left home without my Amex. It's a joint card with my wife. Um, uh, or else I would have put, because there's more, there, there are fancier cards than this. Yes? Correct. In like the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area where they'll charge you more if you use a card. They're violating their terms of agreement with their card. <laughs> and that gas station is in breach of its contract. I'm going to guess, and living in the DMV, that may have been Liberty or an off-brand gas station. Maybe it was Sunoco or Shell, but those are all independently owned operators. Here's an interesting fact. Gas stations, I don't know if you guys know the economics of gas stations, but I'll do a little aside here. Gas is not profitable for the vast majority of gas stations. It's break-even business. The purpose of the gas station is the convenience store. The convenience store is extremely high markups, and that's their money. If you just buy gas and leave, you are basically an irrelevant customer in their business model. They need you to get the economy of scale and volume to move the gas. But if you sum of the entire gas station industry, their entire profit, is less than what they pay in swipe fee for the entire industry because it's a low margin business. It's a competitive business, right? You can see across. And the reason they're bringing you in to pay cash is because you're actually more profitable for them at 10 cents less a gallon in cash than you are in credit. In part because this fee is two to three percent plus about 30 cents of fixed fee, 30, 40 cents, depending on the card. And I ignore this fixed fee in some of my analysis going forward, but my friend who runs a small coffee shop in Silver Spring, Maryland, Bump and Grind, it's an awesome little spot. <laughs> swipe fee, he spends more in swipe fee than he does in buying coffee. Because swipe fee is one of the smallest, uh, 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 coffee is one of the smallest average dollar volume. I'll, I'll finish on this in one point. How many of you use a Starbucks app? It's the number one online payment app. The economics of the Starbucks app are irrelevant to brand loyalty, but they're deeply relevant to how a card-based system works. The economics of a Starbucks app are what? You upload 50 bucks, and then you buy your $5 coffee 10 times, and they give you a free cup of coffee. You can quibble with my numbers here, depending on what level you are. It's about the, the, the simple version. Why are they doing this? If you swiped a credit card for a $5 transaction, it would be about 50 cents for them. 30, 40 cents of swipe fee plus the little percent. Swipe fee is very high. The average transaction at Starbucks is, I think, seven or eight dollars. Um, so they figured that by uploading 50 bucks once onto the app, it's not about the interest or float they make on your $50. It's not about the fact that you leave a little money there that you may never actually spend to zero. What it's really about is they've saved $4.50. They paid the swipe fee once instead of 10 times. And for $4.50, they can give you a free cup of coffee. You know, coffee doesn't really cost Starbucks almost anything. And that is why they want to move you to their payment app. And that economics gets to this following point, which is that when I pay cash in Starbucks, they're getting 10% less than when I pay a card. So as an economist, as a merchant, and the merchant's constructed by this, by the way, there's an extra case that just came out. How many of you know Amex v. Ohio? It's decided in the Supreme Court. I, I got three. This is at a, at a law school. It, it was not the sexiest case in the Supreme Court's docket. But it was a pivotal case that was decided five to four that I think was a giant mistake that reaffirmed this business model. And it turned on an antitrust question that I'm not as an I'm not an antitrust economist. I'm not an antitrust lawyer. I'm not a lawyer by any stretch, although I've written a lot of law. Um, but what I am is an economist who understands, regardless of the legal question, the economic impact of the court's finding is people who pay in cash subsidize me and people who pay in fancy cards because the merchant has to offer us the same price, and by offering us the same price. Blind, they have to average their total net. Their net is minus this cost. So this guy is giving me more money because I'm, I'm costing less. That's inequality number one. 
You guys with me? Inequality number two. So J.P. Morgan Chase has gotten two to three percent of everything I bought this year, and you know when you guys have kids, you're going to appreciate life gets real expensive. We just started charging summer camps on our credit card because it's online, right? So let's say that my family uh, um, charges eighty thousand dollars a year of expense, right, on our cards. So that's. 1600 bucks at 2%. Say, say Chase is a little bit better. That's $2,000 Chase has just earned off of me using their card. But why do I have this Southwest? I have a million cards I couldn't choose from, right? Chase has formed a partnership with Southwest to give me some of that back in the form of points, which I can actually calculate because for Southwest, 70 points equals $1. It's, very, it's much easier to calculate this. I could have shown you my Marriott card, uh, which is much more challenging. 70 points is a dollar. So I can calculate $1 here, one, $1 spent is one point, but it's $2 on this kind of thing. It's, I think, five for Southwest flights. I flew Southwest today, booked on this. Thank you very much. Um, and that's money I'm getting back. So let's just say I get a 1% cash back. That's kind of like a very standard transaction, right? Uh, one and a half percent. I'm, 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 a, I'm a little higher end. I have better offers, right? People compete. So one and a half percent cash back on 80,000 is 1,200 bucks a year, tax free, right? These are called rebates. The way our tax code works, this is not income, this is a rebate, right? If it were a check of earned income, like a dividend from J.P. Morgan, I'd have a series of taxes. But there was a decision made as these things expanded um, to call them rebates under the tax code, which are non-taxed items. So 1,200 bucks tax-free is really about 1,800 bucks of pre-tax income. Uh, Maryland's a high-tax state where I live, right? Because these are tax-free at the federal level and at the state level. 1800 bucks tax free of income a year is what I earn on the payment system. All right? The average American earns about 50 to 60 thousand dollars a year. That's about 2 weeks of pay to the average median worker. So for 2 weeks of their life is what I'm getting uh, just from how I buy things. This is a huge exacerbator of income inequality. Because the median worker doesn't have access to this. Their credit score isn't good enough. They're not charging enough money. They may have a subprime card where they're getting interest and fees. They're probably using maybe a debit card. Or growing increasingly because the economics of debit are not in their favor, and I'll get to that in the second part of my talk, they're using a prepaid card where they get bupkis. They actually pay a small amount to have the safety and security of a prepaid card versus cash. This is the first way in which how all of us are contributing and benefiting from a system that's promoting income inequality. Just simply how we pay for things. Uh, and because the, the best way to change that, in my opinion, would have been to decide Amex v. Ohio the other way, to give merchants the ability to price discriminate, which is more common in Europe, I might add, where people at the register say 3% surcharge to use credit. That would change, be a ball game changer. This is also a fundamental area where I don't believe financial technology is going to innovate our way out of it. Because you're going to have to offer me a lot of money to not use my Southwest card or my Platinum Sapphire Amex as you guys get higher up the chain. And it's going to be very hard to innovate a new market that's going to try to grab these top 10% of people who are benefiting handsomely from the current system. Let me pause here for questions because the second part is a little weedier and also promote is, is how the bottom half is getting actively screwed. This is kind of passively, right? None of the people who use cash or prepaid cards appreciate the magnitude of this. And all of us who get the magnitude of it don't really connect the dots to understand who's paying, which is fundamentally the bottom half of people in the fact that they're paying essentially higher prices for the same goods I'm. You would never imagine a store that said 2%, uh, all prices are 2% less if you earned over $150,000 last year. 
But that's essentially what cash registers are. So let me pause for questions. Mm -mm. A department store credit card, like a, the Macy's card, is a bank-issued line of credit in which uh, Macy's probably pays a lower swipe fee. They probably have negotiated that down, but Macy's economics there is actually tracking what you buy. So this is a different side of payments altogether that's not really an equality side, but it's an information side. So J.P. Morgan Chase knows how much money I've spent at Macy's, Banana Republic, Under Armour, Right, And if you're really sophisticated, you can find all my cards and buy that all online. But you don't know what piece of clothing I bought where. You don't know whether I bought my shoes at Nordstrom, my suit at Nordstrom, my ties. Right? You can't track what are called two sides of the receipt, the itemized portion and the total portion. The itemized portion isn't transmitted in the exchange. Macy's really wants to know what I buy there. And so when on the Macy's card, they can track my itemized transactions because it's like a loyalty. I don't know if you guys at your supermarket, how many of you at the supermarket, you give them a little, or CVS, you give them a phone number and they, you get a CVS receipt that's like 10 feet tall, <laughs> right? Um, for whatever reason, it's not privacy. Like I just never did that. I use my mom's phone number at the giant and I use my sister at CVS. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I get a lot of products that are not for me when you use your sister's phone number at the pharmacy. But what that really is, is about uh, tracking, your, tracking your purchase to target advertisements to do this. One of the payments revolutions that's going to come in the future is when people can get both sides of the receipt. And when you pair that with indoor GPS, which is coming, I go into the mall and somebody can figure out, hey, wait a second, you're walking towards the Under Armour store and you, know, you don't actually buy your sneakers there, you've actually been buying golf shirts. And so, did you know Macy's has a sale on golf shirts? And then a thing pops up on your phone, right? You guys all thought it was gonna be Foot Locker, right? And I was gonna make a, make a shoe comment. I'm from Maryland, so I'm an Under Armour guy. But the, I, I know Duke is a, is a Nike. Um, so it was. Um, so, um, so, so, so that's actually what the the store cards are. Other yes. So is the proposal in part one that cash back should go away, or that is it that merchants get to price in and reclaim cash back from the consumers? Right. So, so this that's a, so so the proposal is a bit of a Rorschach test as to how you think about public policy, right? As a as a like if, if I were thinking what AOC or what like a strong liberal would be, I would ban cash back or I would tax cash back, right? Why is this untaxed rebate income? It should be taxable income. I mean, it's literally cash back. It's one thing if it's frequent flyer miles, how do you value that? Now it's actually a check from a bank, right? How's that different from, a, from your interest? Um, my belief as an economist, and maybe I'm moving a little more in the center, is the merchant should have the authority to differ, price differentiate based on their total cost. I think had Amex v. Ohio been decided differently and it had gone five to four in a different way, which I think it might have had Merrick Garland been on the court, um, then I think that would have solved the issue and let merchants figure it all out. Um, a true free market person would say, listen, the merchant has the authority, they don't have to take it. There's a reason people, a lot of merchants don't take Amex. Amex is an extra point, basically, relative to Chase and the other folks. At the, at the extreme luxury end, it's not. Uh, Chase Sapphire is comparable with an Amex Platinum in terms of the fee for the merchant. But they would say, listen, the market's the market and merchants can be cash only. Now, cash only is a dicey business, um, but that's kind of the, the, free, the far free market people say, you know what, it's not a problem. People compete for rich people's business, let rich people get more money off of this. If income inequality is your problem, do a different tax. Or maybe the market's fine with that. Um, but I think that's, if, if I'm giving you like an honest, these are the different choices, that's where I would choose. I think reasonable people can argue each of the different spectrums. 
other questions? All right. So now I want to get to the other part of the debate, which is the other system of the payment system. Um, how many people here are going to get paid on Friday, March 1st? All right, two people. We're, we're the only. You get paid on the 25th, which is Monday. So Friday happens to be every other Friday. March 1st happens to be a Friday this year. If you take your paycheck into the bank and deposit it, or you take your phone and deposit, how many of you deposit when you get a check from a relative or something on your phone, right? That's the check truncation law that Lee mentioned that I helped write. That made that legal. Before that, you actually had to physically present the check. Um, why is that money not immediately available? Maybe you have a credit union that offers to, but under the law, the Expedited Funds Availability Act, which was a 1970s era consumer protection law, how many of you guys have noticed that all these consumer laws tend to be somewhere in the 70s? Um, it says the following. The bank has to make the first $100 available to you immediately. Up until that, it can choose to hold your funds for up to three days for something called a local check and five days for something called a non-local check. There used to be a distinction between that based on which of the 32 Federal Reserve processing districts you were in. Today, there are one processing district relevant. But they can hold your check from Friday, these are business days, to the credit you at the end of the day, Wednesday, if they want. And that's on, based on the fact that Monday isn't a holiday. If you'd gone two weeks earlier when there was President's Day, they could hold it for nearly a week. Now, there's a reason why in the 70s it took a week to physically fly this check around. Uh, there were concerns about fraud, bad checks, the money's not there in the account. Today, there's no reason why, or should let me put it a different way, there are two reasons why. One has to do with the actual technology about how the payments are processed and credited. The second has to do with the law and who wins and loses from this. Let me start with the second, and then I'll get to the first. Okay, I don't care. I don't care when my check is available, because I have a bunch of money in my bank account. My wife didn't get paid for an entire month. She's a career government employee. The government was shut down. She actually had to go to work because she was in a national security exemption, but she didn't get paid for a month. Missed two and a half paychecks. We were okay. We, we put off paying for summer camp a little bit, but our mortgage, everything else like that. Half of Americans uh, and everybody in that top 10% basically has that cushion. According to the Federal Reserve, 40% of Americans couldn't come up with $400 to pay for an emergency without selling money or borrowing, selling an item or borrowing money. The bottom half that I told you about, the 160 million people that have less than the top three people, regularly touch the zero lower end of their bank account. For them, time is money. For them, March 1st, the first of the month means rent, mortgage, childcare, car payment, maybe your credit cards, gym membership, there are a bunch of recurring things, utility bills, etc. Those are debited the first. It matters if my money's not gonna be available till Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. How do they handle this? Why, this slow system costs them billions of dollars a year in the aggregate. Americans spend, um, was it, it was, um, I came up with, three, um, I don't remember, seven billion dollars a year in check cashing services, uh, 35 billion dollars a year in overdraft, and another, I think, $18 billion a year in payday lending. Certainly some elements of each of those three are irrespective of this time, and certain could be eliminated by this time. I'm going to tell you a story, and it started me on this whole research. I take my girls ice skating on Saturday mornings. And after the end of ice skating, we go to the bank. I do my banking. They have little uh, kid accounts. They put in the money from their piggy bank. They get a lollipop. I teach them banks are good. So we're sitting in the bank and there's two women um, in front, one woman in front of me and one at the teller. It's Saturday morning, it's a slow day. The woman at the teller says, when's my check gonna be there? The woman says, not till Wednesday or Thursday. Monday was a holiday. It was Saturday morning. She said, but I need my money, I have debits coming. She said, I'm sorry. She said, what's gonna happen if I hit a zero? She said, you're in an overdraft. $35, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. She's yelling. The woman says, well, you know, what if I have more than one? The teller goes, it's $35 each time, ma'am. Boom, she explodes. 
Now, I feel sorry. I know the teller. I come into the bank every couple Saturdays. You know, this isn't the teller's fault. And so the woman's getting angrier and angrier and yelling. And my kids are starting to get anxious. And I'm like, look, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about this and thinking about faster payments and all these other things I work on. I'm like, God, how weird is it that I saw this? Here's the mind-blowing part of the story. The other woman in line who's in front of me, who's also waiting as this woman's screaming louder and louder at the teller, all of a sudden walks over to her and goes, "Hun, I got gotcha. you. Go around the corner of the check casher and bring back the cash. You'll be fine. And the woman says, well, what, how, when's, when's the cash go? And the woman goes, oh, well, your cash is credited immediately. Oh my god, thank you so much, thank you so much. And she walks out the door. Now here's my takeaway from this anecdote. Number one, this economics of what this woman did were brilliantly rational. The check casher is 20 bucks. By saving one overdraft, she just saved 15. And I know for a fact she had more than one. 70 bucks versus 20. She just saved 50 bucks. That's a lot of money. And who knows, that's a two overdrafts, right? I can keep counting. Two, check cashing demand is not on unbanked people. The woman clearly has a bank account. It's not a question of is there a branch nearby? Are there hours open? Is it convenient? The woman was at the bank, <laughs> at the teller. It wasn't even like the line was too long. She was sitting at the teller, right? That's not the problem, right? The problem is the speed of the money getting in there made going to a check casher the economically optimal decision. And that's just a fact. Two, there were three customers at this bank, me and two people. One of them had the problem, the other one knew the answer. For that other woman to know that answer, she must know that problem. I never thought of that, and I'm an expert in payments. I wrote the law governing how the check is deposited. I study this at a fancy think tank. It never dawned on me to tell her to go to where the check casher was. And while I've lived in Silver Spring, Maryland my entire life, it's where I went to high school, I live a mile from my sister, and I've seen the check casher vaguely on the road. I've driven past the sign a million times. I couldn't have given her turn-by-turn -turn directions like this woman did going out of the bank. So some percent of that $7 billion a year in check cashing fees is solved by having your payments expand immediately. I have another piece of data on this, um, and then I'm going to turn to their point. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, set up in Dodd-Frank, used to do, had this complaint portal where anybody could go online if you could figure out this weird government agency and argue a complaint. And they would publish reports on what people were complaining about. People complain a lot about credit bureaus. But when they did a deep dive on banks, the number two complaint in America about all banks and all bank products were about the following. When you guys deposit a check on your phone, I saw a bunch of you raise your hand, do you get an email saying your deposit's been approved? I get that, right? The number two complaint in America were people complaining about that email and then getting an overdraft. Because they read that email to mean the money's there. That's actually not what that email reads. That email reads, you submitted the little thing correctly. Don't worry, you can tear up your check. It's going to go through processing. And it will be there in three to five business days, or no less than three business days. Um, but people didn't realize that, and they went and spent money, and then they got hit with this $35 overdraft fee. And they were so pissed off about it, about the fee, that they went and found this random government agency that hasn't been around that long, and logged on the consumer complaint portal and complained. <laughs> That's how prevalent this is. So I would estimate that this is about, in the aggregate, costing the bottom half of people $10 billion a year. If based on a conservative estimate of 10 to 20% of these fees going away. And I'm not counting late fees from just saying, you know what, if I pay my power bill five days late, it's $4, whatever. You know, I'm not talking about interest fees, about carrying longer interest until I pay off my credit card. I'm thinking a very small number here, in my opinion. $10 billion a year, right? You guys heard of welfare, TANF? That's a $17 billion a year program. That's how much the government gives to the poorest people. This is how much our slow payment system is taking away. Now, why is the system so slow? Well, the system's so slow because nobody cares to improve it. Or put it in a very specific way, the Federal Reserve is not invested in its improvement. The Federal Reserve, America's third central bank, operates 
a clearing system, the Automated Clearinghouse, or ACH, which is the network of things that process all the payments that's governed by this law. They operate under a technology that's called batch technology. And I went to one of these check carrying plants in the Inner Harbor of Baltimore one night, and it looked like something from my childhood of a film strip, which was this old like machine with 63 slots, because uh, it was 64-bit processing, and there was one bit for the random thing. And you just put a bunch of paper in it, and went each of the little routing ticker codes, and it came out. And then you just run them batch after batch. And when you run a batch network, the full batch takes as long as it takes to run the very last transaction. I can't promise you the first transaction posts before the last. And when you're doing payments, you're netting things out. right? Every time we send each other money, it's not like the banks actually, you know, it's not like JP Morgan Chase and Bank of America are constantly moving $30 between each other. right? They're settling on a basis. Um, you can't move a batch payment into what's called a real-time system in which the ledgers are moved individually in real time. You have to build a new system from scratch. Mexico did this in 2004. So did South Africa. Poland did it. The Bank of England did it in 2007 when the first iPhone came out. This is an XR. Since then, we've improved our batch system slightly. The, uh, your batch will clear um, uh, with, on the same, at the end of the business day, if you post by 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific. There's no time break if you're one of the 50 million Americans in the West Coast. Um, in addition, just because this thing is clear doesn't mean the bank legally has to make the funds available to you. There were banks, and this is well documented in the press, that they would do this system where they would run all the debits before they ran all the credits in order to maximize overdraft fee. That's pretty shady, don't you think? Hold on. I'll go one step further. They would go to a person and look at your account and say, at 10 a.m. you spent 100 bucks, then you spent 50 bucks, then you spent three, then you spent 10, then you spent 12, then you spent 250. And they would reorder your transactions for processing to process the largest ones first to get you to zero and then give you the maximum number of overdrafts. So you are not actually being debited in your ledger contemporaneously with the timing of your accounts, but rather in an algorithmic way to maximize overdraft fee. I never paid that. In fact, if I even get an overdraft, I call my bank angry and they refund it like, oh my god, I'm sorry, we didn't mean to do this to you. Right? Uh, you raise. <clears throat> That's right. And a very deliberate strategic decision. Some, th there are stories about the guy who figured it out at, I forget which bank, who got like a $10 million bonus. And by the way, that was you know, well earned from the bank's profit perspective. In a real time system, that's impossible. In a real time system, you can't do that. In fact, the consumer is empowered by having the information. The technology to do this real time system exists. You just have to build it from scratch. And uh, the Federal Reserve has chosen not to do that. In addition, as the regulator of the system, there are other private clearing systems. The clearinghouse operates one very old in New York. It started uh, around uh, before the Civil War, which was a period when America had no central bank. As I said, the Fed is the third. The second central bank ended under Andrew Jackson. Uh, so there's a long period without one. Payments still cleared and settled. We still had banks. Um, and so other clearing houses do this, but they operate under the regulatory authority of the Fed. As regulator, the Fed is inherently conflicted by its operational arm. That is, if the Fed wanted to do the right thing and mandate real time, in six months, everybody has to pay in real time. OK, your operation system will shut down. It is impossible, almost impossible, to ask a federal agency to do something regulatorily that it cannot comply with operationally. It just doesn't happen. In addition, there's been historically very little political pressure to do this. Americans don't fully understand that your check ought to be there immediately. I mean, if, if they can send you an email that it's approved for deposit, 
They can send you this, they can put the money there. Some credit unions voluntarily do this as a, as a good. Um, but this is an area where financial technology can disrupt. This is an area where the bottom half could operate and move their money to a platform that does this. And to the bank's credit, uh, some of the big banks kind of realize that if they don't move this way, there's going to be enough consumer demand where they could be Uberized. Or maybe a different way to put it, if they create this product, they can make a decent amount of money on it because this overdraft issue is, is starting to get attacked very much politically. All the banks that got caught ordering these transactions, essentially the big banks got under huge public pressure to change it. Um, and, uh, and, and most did. Not all, but most. So they invested in a new technology. It's called the uh, RTP, real-time payments, uh, and have started offering this. Uh, PNC recently, it's basically the 48 largest banks they've started offering. PNC actually has a product now where they'll give you availability to your money for 2% of your deposit. Does it sound like a good or bad deal to people? Bad? Who here thinks bad? Who here thinks good? Most of you think I don't know yet. Well, if I had a thousand bucks and I was going to, it's 2%, 20 bucks. Saves me one overdraft. Life's about alternatives. If I have 500 bucks, it's only 10 bucks. That's half of what the check casher charges me. It's nuts to me to lose 2% of your pay to have access to it 72 hours faster. But life is an economics are about alternatives, right? If it's a $39 late fee, it's an awful good deal, right? As these products get rolled out, banks can charge for them. There's another economic value incentive that you have that differentiates a bank participating in real-time payments from one of the um, 5,700 banks that are not the 48 largest. By the way, the platform's open. Any bank can join it. Uh, most payment networks have to be that way. Um, so, you know. This is kind of uh, uh, where I think the second phase of this is, which is how the payment system charges those who have less, more money, to access their own money for things that the wealthy never have to think twice about. I don't know if my paycheck's going to be available on the first or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, because I don't care. I'll close with this, and then you guys can answer. Direct deposit is not instant. Direct deposit. If my person, direct deposit is when your payor hits the button to, to submit your bank to, to, to notice that and go through the system. If you get your money in the bank on Thursday, it's probably because the person did direct deposit on Monday or Tuesday. It's not, and I found this out that people didn't understand this when I posted one of my pieces on, on Brookings Facebook page, and a bunch of people wrote like, oh yeah, I had that problem when I used to get paychecks, but now I signed up for direct deposit and I'm all good. Not true. You're not realizing it because of the way your payroll's processed. And this gets to another question, which is a broader issue, which is why do I have to work for two weeks and get paid week three? Why don't I get paid the same day that I do that work? If you're an Uber driver, anybody here drive Uber in their spare time? You can actually request that to get paid the same day. Uber will charge you five bucks. And they're charging you five bucks uh, in part because they're fronting you the money because the real-time payment platform hasn't been developed. If you develop this network, there are a series of auxiliary programs and pro uh, uh, payment technologies and customer transactions that may occur from that. Remember, Uber can't work on cash. You cannot get the benefit of Uber without at least a debit or prepaid card, depending on whether Uber accepts prepaid. So let me stop for questions. those fees in and of itself are very high. So if you don't have $20 to spare, although it might be better, you don't see the logic of that. So who, who is you know, developing policies or thinking about those people who live by these things? So you mentioned TANF. So they went to a debit card format, so all of these different formats. What do those things need for people that are at the very margins of society? 
So the bottom group of people, right? Cash. Uh, cash is kind of efficient. Cash clears in real time, right? You have safety issues, you have concerns. Uh, you don't build credit history. It makes expanding going up. But the 7% of Americans lack a bank account. So I'm gonna take it from your question that you're focused on the bottom 7%, right? For the bottom 7%, a lot of them, about half, I think about a third to half, depending on the surveys. It's a small sample and a little bit harder to sample than, than the rest of America, used to have bank accounts. And they've chosen not to because of the fees. There's a high monthly minimum fee, there's an overdraft risk. This is not a product that's economically valuable for them. In addition, you say, well, make the banks offer them free fee, free accounts, even if it doesn't matter to them. It's a lot more expensive to offer an account to put somebody because there's a high due diligence cost uh, having to do with anti-money laundering concerns that have been ramped up substantially, uh, in my opinion, often for no good reason. Uh, put a different way, I don't think the bottom 7% of people are terrorists. And I think that we've ramped up our anti-money laundering thing because we want to catch Al-Qaeda, not because we're terribly interested in where that 7% got their $50. Maybe, you know, I'm not saying that. By the way, does anybody know the, the highest profile person who just got put in jail for money laundering? Who here has watched the Jersey Shore? Come on, be honest. Maybe, maybe, maybe my reference is already five years old. The situation, Mike the situation was, was convicted of tax evasion and money laundering because if you put, put in more than $10,000 in cash, the bank has to file a report. And so the situation being the smartest guy in the Jersey Shore thought if he just deposited $9,900 a bunch of times, nobody would file. That's called structuring. And, 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 and he went there. Um, there are a bunch of things. Denny Hastert, you guys know who Denny Hastert is? Former speaker, right? He's in jail not for what it seems like he committed, which was uh, child molestation, but he's actually in jail for pleading for money laundering, illegally taking cash out of his bank account to avoid the $10,000 limit to pay the victim. That's what he's in. He's not in jail for the, what I would consider the, the true crime, or right? I'm not minimizing structuring. The reason we have these money laundering is to catch folks in that situation, but it requires a high due diligence. Americans filed, the banks filed three million suspicious activity reports last year. That number is up 1.7 million more than in 2010. So I'm not going to pre-Al Qaeda stuff, 2001. You can understand why you might want more of these reports in 2005 than 2001. From 2010 to 2016. So for the bottom of your group of your folks, I would say the following. One is they're mostly dealing in a cash-based system. For them, the biggest problem is making payments that are increasingly moving digitally. So I want to pay my bills, right? I have to go somewhere in cash that accepts a cash system. There's an argument that as some enterprises are going cashless, that's discriminatory for them because they don't have the access to buy even a prepaid card because you have to put that money up front. Um, that is, I think, kind of the frontier of where the future is looking for them. When you ask the question about you know, this time delay in banking, I would say for them the biggest, one of the reasons the bank account doesn't provide much value for them is when they get paid, they need access to those funds immediately. So if, if I'm that bottom person and I worked my, my tail off this week and I don't have a direct deposit and I get a check on Friday, one of the reasons I'm going to the check casher and not even doing direct deposit is because that money's not gonna be available to me on Monday and I have to pay my rent, I have to pay my utilities, I may have to pay my child care, I may have to pay my child support, my alimony, whatever that is, is on the first of the month. And so I would argue to you, moving to real-time payments creates more value in the banking system for them than the current system. One of the reasons why the current system is not as valuable to them on a minute day-to-day -day basis are things like this delay. You make a good pitch, but there are some complications that I'm sure you've gone into. Uh, one is the anonymity of cash. Mm -hmm. In fact, that even if you're getting a real-time payment, you have to get cash to pay all the people you have to pay. Uh, a lot of people, so until everybody's off of cash, uh, sweetener, mm -hmm. let's say, you've still got the same problem. 
So I'm totally for cash. Let me be very clear. I'm not, I'm, I'm against cashless. I think cash plays a valuable role because I'm not sure the economics work for a person who makes $15,000 a year to be banked. They may require a subsidy. The liberal in me would like to impose on the bank a requirement and duty to serve to provide that person an account, even if that person is a money loser. But that's, I don't believe the American public writ large has the political will to do that. Um, in terms of the question about um, uh, the payment system needing to go to the other side, which is one of the problems with payments is it's a network. It only works if everybody else is on it. It's a giant barrier to entry to moving to an alternative payment system, right? Because I need to know that my car, one of the reasons I carry that card everywhere is I'm just confident I can get a, I can live with it if I don't have a single dollar in my wallet. Um, and so you can create, we're at a tipping point with technology where you can create that very differently. I'll tell you a story, I was in China, I have a paper coming out on Chinese payments. And China operates, the only other place I've seen that operates similar to China is the parking lot here. <laughs> so I got a parking pass here for the day. How many of you guys have, right? And there's a little QR code that you scan, right? Do you realize, that's how China works. Everything you pay in China is a QR card on your phone based on two apps, Alipay and WeChat. And how, how, how many people here have WeChat? Any, yep, one, two, three. Right, WeChat's larger than Facebook. China, it's the largest messaging system in the world, larger than Facebook. Alipay is, is, like, uh, is the payment arm of Amazon. Money exists there and is transmitted through the payment system completely detached from the banking network. I can WeChat pay you money in what's called a red envelope. And if I were paying for parking here, I would have held up my phone and the QR code would have scanned it. It, it would have docked my WeChat money some amount and it would have gone there and they may have paid their employees on that, or if it had been on Alipay, they may have paid your suppliers, they may have bought the pizza on that. Nowhere in all of those transactions is a banking system. We have payments intertangled in the bank, in banking. Everybody here appreciates the separation of banking and commerce in America, right? This is one of the few crowds where we all appreciate, right? Other countries don't. What I've come to realize is we separate banking and commerce in law, and we think about things that are banking, and we put payments in the banking realm. But it really isn't legally there, is it? The definition of bank, as I understand it, and there's a room full of lawyers, is accepting deposits, having deposit insurance, right? The definition of bank is all about charter type, deposit type, it's nowhere about payments. Payments are money transmitting businesses, which are state regulated non-payment entities. Right? PayPal's not a bank. You can create, thanks to the ubiquity of technology, it used to be these magnetic cards were linked with banks because it was the ubiquity of the technology of knowing the money was there behind the system. But thanks to phones, which are not correlated to income, banking, how you pay is deeply correlated to income. Whether or not you own this is not. Right? Whether or not you use this for mobile banking among people who have bank accounts, whether or not you use your phone for banking is not correlated to income. In fact, um, minorities use their phone for mobile banking more than whites, not controlling for income. It's the only statistic I've ever seen in all my years of banking that where you have what I would consider a good product, right? Mobile banking should be a good thing, with a higher adoption rate. By the way, as an econometrician, that's, that's an example of what econometricians call a hidden variable bias. Race has nothing to do with mobile banking. Do you know what does? What's the variable? Nope. Age. Young people use this. Old people are much less likely to. Minority population skews younger. You control for age, the, the, the relationship goes away. It's not a racial thing, it's an age thing. But here's something that's fascinating. If I know what you do on your phone, I know how much money you have. If you're rich, you use your phone to move money. If you're poor, you use your phone to check your balance. Why? Because you're afraid of hitting zero. Why? Because you don't want to get a fee, all these 
problems and fees that come when you go zero. What you use your phone for is deeply correlated to income. Again, because I don't care what my balance is, because it's always high. Or put a different way, it's always high enough from zero that I don't have to worry. But that's the luxury of the top, which is not the reality for the majority of Americans. Other questions? So how come you had the Dodd-Frank legislation dealt with a lot of abuses by banks, also did mm -hmm. with the other things, that at no point along this that statute did they ever consider the idea that if you have an electronic contribution that Duke makes to my bank, that I have to wait 72 hours to get that money, unless Duke makes some arrangement with Bank of America. So I'll tell you three great things. One is the, there's only so much capacity to argue an issue. And the payments capacity in Dodd-Frank was completely eaten up by something known as the Durbin Amendment, which as I said earlier, was one of these things that was not core to Dodd-Frank. It was the only vote in the Senate that was filibustered. Every other part of Dodd-Frank amendment was a 50 voter, as they call it. The opposition to Durbin by the banks was so hard it was made a 60 voter and it passed over the objection of Senator Chris Dodd who voted against it, a part of his own bill. And what the Durbin Amendment did was it said the Federal Reserve had to promulgate new regulations on the swipe fee of debit that essentially reduced debit from 35 cents to 20 cents. In other words, it took 15 cents of each debit swipe and reallocated it from banks to merchants. Maybe in some macroeconomic way, the merchants argued it will lower my price by one cent. Right, which is, you know, debit is about 30% of transactions and blah, 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 right? I don't, people have done some pretty good papers on this that have shown no price impact from debit. And it was a great political food fight between the big box real things, Best Buy, Walmart, right? You can imagine how much Walmart cared about this versus JP Morgan City and all the, and the big banks hid behind the small banks who are deeply pushing it. And the big box stores hid behind the small retailers. I always think of my dry cleaner who doesn't take Amex, so I have to use debit, right? Um, and, uh, and that was a huge political fight, and that sucked up a lot of the political oxygen. That's reason one. Reason two, and this is a failure of the bill that I helped work on in 2003. When we, in 2003, most people didn't really have real-time payments. And when we argued to expedite the payment process, the banks countered with a concern about fraud, they countered with adoption rates of the technology, and the Fed countered with, we're not that sure about this. We don't want to change how things are going. We want to make sure we're doing this big thing. Trust us. We have the regulatory authority to lower it if we want. And I, I originally fought to, to, to require it. I ended up uh, getting whittled down to a study. That's a very common thing in law, which is you, you, you come with a requirement, you get with a, a, a study with authority. The study was done five years after enactment. Uh, originally, the Fed proposed 10. I was a young staffer, and I said, that's way too long for 10 years. And I, whittled, and I just jammed them at five. That was a mistake on my part. Within five years, they had a, the study was due five years. They chose to honor that time frame strategically. Often, people, studies come in late. I'm sure nobody here has ever done a paper late. Uh, and they started the study three years after the law had passed. And three years after the law had passed, not that much adoption had occurred. So the study concluded it was too soon to tell. Um, one. Two was in 2010, the banks were still making a decent amount of float. There was still some interest rate on this. And in requiring the bank to move that faster, you'd be reducing banks' profitability on overdraft and on float. And in the financial crisis, the goal of policy was to make the banks a little healthier, right? Now, this debit fee thing, again, Dodd lost the vote. The banking interest lost the vote. It was real money, but it was money going to a, 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 an identified political constituency, retailers. That's a very powerful political constituency. Who's the political constituency I have? Who's the political constituency for my argument? The bottom half? That's a very weak political constituency, particularly on a topic that, I mean, they, they get very agitated about Glass-Steagall, which I don't think would help the bottom half of people at all, versus something specific like this, uh, is the second reason why I don't think it was there. 
and people didn't have the experience in ubiquity, right? Even though England had adopted it three years earlier, folks didn't realize it. The last point, I'm gonna blame my friends in the consumer movement, whom I tend to like, they tend to be overly concerned about fraud. And they have huge, huge amounts of legislative remedy for very, very small cases and incidents of fraud. And you can look back on this Check 21 Act, they had consumer groups, off, some of them opposed it. So what, you know, if you're not gonna have your paper check, how can you prove it without the physical substance? And there's all this legislative about rules about fraud and substitute checks and all this stuff. I think the Federal Reserve found seven counts of trillions of payments. They found seven incidents. Right, people just, fraud is detected in a lot of different ways. Uh, but that, that, tech, that, that argument still exists to this day, which I think they're, the second argument that consumer groups get wrong is they're back in the 1970s when people were playing the float. So in the 1970s, when everything was done by check and, and the poor didn't have debit cards, the problem was less severe because yes, I got paid on Friday and I deposited it, but I gave my rent check to my landlord at 4.50 p.m. on Friday, knowing that they couldn't go to the bank and deposit it. They couldn't deposit in the phone. There's no such thing as an ATM. The bank didn't open until Monday. And by the time the guy deposited on Monday and it cleared three days later, my Friday pay would have cleared one day sooner. And oh, by the way, if I was a richer, sophisticated consumer, I was getting 10%. Banks used to pay 10% interest on your account. I, I'm too young to have seen those days as well, but believe me, I've heard from people I respect that they really existed in the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, I think of 1974. And so they were saying, you know what, like people benefit from this timing game. And what they fail to appreciate is with the advent of new technology and modernization, the most empowering thing you can do to people is tell them how much money they have in the bank account right now and let them make their own sets of choices. And they're not playing these like three day arbitrage times, and the banks aren't either because they figured out how to reorder the payment systems, particularly with the digital debits. This is another area where I think liberals have gone off track, uh, and ironically, I think they borrowed the idea from the neoclassical economists. The nonsense that um, late charges, interest rates, uh, pe penalties and that are all fungible, that Scalia said this is just a proxy market. I think it's messed up the whole payday lending debate. Because people who use, uh, not pay, uh, yeah, payday lending, for them, it's a fee to avoid having their car repaired or their car. Ah. It's a very different mindset from, and they don't care about liberals running around saying they're paying 300% interest. They laugh at that. They say that's just irrelevant. I have a dollar pay, $45, so that mm -hmm. I have my car tomorrow, and I see that as a convenient fee, which changes So what, one of the things I like about my real-time payment argument and my policy of mandating clearing immediately is I think it will give a huge value and reduce the demand for payday substantially. And it does, it's not a tax. No, rich people aren't paying, unlike my credit card reward thing, which you could argue. Um, and it's not an interest rate cap. It's not a debate that you know you can't get this, right? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a very appealing solution. I'm very pleased in your example, you said car repossessed and not car repaired. There's a huge error in the way people talk about low income people's immediate demand for money. And it has to do with unplanned expense versus shock to income. In other words, uh, the Center for Responsible Lending, a wonderful national nonprofit located here in, in Durham, did a really interesting analysis where they found that the driver for payday lending was one out of every six people was an unplanned expense. My car broke down. I needed $600 to repair my car. Five out of six times, it was a shock to income, which is your story. I can't make my car payment because I am a painter. One of my side hustles is painting houses and it rained for three weeks in a row and I got short of that. My alimony comes on the first, but my ex was late five days. I'm gonna get it in five days, he's just late. 
all these other stories I can give you of unplanned expense, that's the majority. The story in Washington, which is told by both industry and repeated by folks on the left as well, is unplanned expense. And the solution to unplanned expense is very different. It's budgeting, it's savings, it's all these other things, right? Because I can build a little cushion. Shocks to income are very different. And shocks to income show that when you need income, when it's not there, the timing of when you receive it matters. Uh, for any of you who have not read The Financial Diaries, it's a wonderful book by uh, Jonathan Murdoch and Rachel Schneider. They, they, they do this in-depth study about real people's income. And they show that most you know, people that are somewhere in the, you know, I'll call it the, the 25th to 60th percentile of income, they're cobbling income together from three or more sources. That is between the husband and wife, or whoever else constitutes the family. They're three, it's not just one job, right? This, this idea that two people have two salary jobs and have steady paychecks is much more common. There's a lot of seasonality. J.P. Morgan Chase showed that a quarter of their customers, these are J.P. Morgan Chase customers, so we're already not dealing with the bottom 7%. A quarter of their people have an income shock of 40% or, or more one month of the year. And as people have these giant income shocks, they need funds. So it's the cost of money. And people, policymakers, just assume you can just put it on your car. Oh, you're short this month, you'll put it on your card. They assume a set of short-term financial look instruments. How Real-time payment can't solve that in the sense it can't create more money. But the story I'll tell, and I realize I'm, I'm uh, over time, so I'll close with this. This is a couple who were both hourly workers. And every Sunday, they got their shifts for the week. And so they could calculate how much money they would each earn. And their hours went up and down, right? I mean, that's what life is like. And then they could figure out how much they were short, or put a different way, what bills they could afford to pay and what they couldn't. Let's assume they had, they had bills that they had to pay, or they wanted to avoid the expense of being short. And they said, you know what, I'm, I'm a gig economy, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna drive an Uber for these extra hours. I'm gonna pick up these hours somewhere else. Well, if your bill is due on Friday and you find out the hours you're short on Thursday, how can you do the work, get paid, and have your payment clear by Friday? You can't do that if your payment requires three days to clear. Even if you have this wonderful gig economy of on-demand work, where I costlessly you know, go to TaskRabbit and you know, go and pick up somebody's dry cleaning for a day. Right? In order to unlock this, to empower people more, you have to get to this very, very arcane plumbing of how fast money moves and move into it to an instantaneous amount. In that way, I think we could do more to address our growing problem of income inequality than is greatly appreciated in the current public debate. Thank you all very much for your time.